We happy to have Keith from uh, Stanford visiting us. Uh, Keith was uh, a student at MIT before this. He's done a bunch of work on congestion control, which won the Sitcom Dissertation Award, uh, network emulation, and uh, recently on video processing and video streaming, which I believe would be the uh, focus of his talk today. Uh, interestingly, Keith has been a, a journalist at the Wall Street Journal before this, um, where he wrote articles on technology and healthcare. Keith usually gives very fun talks, so if I were you, I'd pay very close attention to what he has to say. Welcome. Thank you very much. All right, uh, thank you all for coming. It's a lot of fun to be here today. I think I was here like five years ago, the last time I gave a talk here, so you all look the same. So. Um, I, I want to talk about sort of a style of building systems that uses sort of the best parts of functional programming. Not the hard parts, not, you know, monads and, you know, category theory and all the hard parts of what the smart people talk about. Just a very dumb way of using sort of functional design to design systems in a different way. Uh, maybe more uh, modular way in some sense, a less modular way in other sense. Uh, and I'm going to tell you about sort of four ways uh, that we've done this. The, the basic message here is that the benefits in thinking in this functional way are worth uh, thinking about refactoring, sort of the, whatever we're most scared of in computer science. So in my world, it's sort of like, you know, the video codec, the audio codec. And we, we, we treat this as a black box. So there's someone smart in Europe that produces a video codec, and, you know, that's like something we take as a black box. We're not going to appear inside that. Or, you know, TCP congestion control. Many of you have probably heard, like, oh, don't, don't ever try to re-implement TCP. That's just like a fool's errand. You know, don't, don't do that. You should be scared of that. Or, you know, or the compiler, like, oh, you think, you know, the compiler, that's like another black box. Or machine learning, which is a black box. Um, but the idea here is, like, these things that we're scared of, these sort of mega modules, if we break them up into small functions where we can understand the relationship between them, there are considerable gains on sort of traditional metrics like performance and also in sort of understandability and debuggability. Just the mere ability to save and restore the state of something is very powerful. Um, you know, it gives you a real power to be able to save and restore the state of a codec or a congestion controller and say, like, wait a sec, I don't like what just happened. Let's rewind. Let's try it again from the same place. That's a real power that you don't have with a mega module. And if you can get it, there's a lot of cool stuff you can do. So I'm going to tell you about four systems uh, that follow this approach to designing systems with sort of four different benefits. So the first is a system we call X camera that uses this functional idea uh, to split up a video codec into small pieces to be able to get fine-grained parallelism for video encoding, massively parallel. The second one is a system that splits up a JPEG uh, compressor. Uh, it's actually the, the entropy coder in a JPEG file. And the benefit here is to be able to match the needs of a distributed file system, to be able to shard JPEG compression across the individual blocks of a file system. Not files, but just blocks. The third one is sort of a functional design applied to real-time video coding. And the goal here is to be able to match the output of the video coder with the varying capacity of the network. We had to use sort of functional programming for that. The, the idea here is to explore an execution path of the codec without committing to it. And finally, we're trying to build a general intermediate representation to make it easy to encapsulate all these ideas, easy for programmers to design uh, programs that can then be executed with sort of 10,000-way parallelism on functions as a service infrastructure, things like uh, Azure Functions or AWS Lambda or Google Cloud Functions, these sort of exciting new services where you can rent 10,000 cores for five seconds in an economical way. How do we program that kind of system? So there's four different benefits from this uh, sort of functional abstraction, so I'll just, I'll just go into it. And if anyone has questions, you're never shy here at Microsoft, but please interrupt any time. So the first one uh, was at NSDI last year, and it's about sort of parallel video processing. Really, the goal is low latency interactive video processing. If you think about like, what made the personal computer such a powerful thing, it's really this like, taking things that were not interactive, like editing a document, and making them interactive. I remember the first time I used McWrite. It seemed awful. Um, I was more of a McPaint type person. But th this idea that you have like interactive word processing really ushered in a revolution. And, and now we have interactive collaborative word processing. So if you think about it, you know, I have Google Docs on my screen. You have it on your screen. I type in X. I see the effect on my screen immediately. You know, it reflows the document. But I also see the effect, you see the effect immediately on your screen. Well, it's very powerful, this sort of uh, collaborative interactive editing. But you know, people don't really read text anymore. What is the most popular type of media in the world and on the internet? It's video, yeah. We spend most of our time watching video. Most of the bits definitely over the internet are video. Like, it would be nice to have a Google Docs for video where you could make an instant edit. Anyone ever hit, like, made a home movie? 
Maybe you have kids. You, ma'am, you made a home movie? And how long was the movie? Uh, three minutes. Three minutes. Did you edit the movie in any way? No. No, okay. Has anyone edited a home movie? Like, tried to make a change? Okay, you sir in the back. How long was your movie? Uh, I don't know, like three minutes. Was it like a child's birthday party or something like that? No, this is actually like developer demo video. Okay, developer demo. Three minutes, okay. And you did you edit it? Okay, so after you made, a, if you wanted to make like the smallest change you could make, how long would it take before someone else could watch the edited video? With the rendering and the uploading and all that? Okay, so like more than real time. Okay, so like you're making a three minute change that takes you five minutes. Like imagine if like every time you type in X in Google Docs, like it took five minutes to see the answer. So that's, that's like kind of where we are right now. And it's like, we're back to like, you know, pre-Microsoft era, like the 1970s, like of word processing is where we are in video. And like, if you had interactive ability to sort of play with video, there's all kinds of stuff you could do. You could say like, you know, let's try, let's apply some filter, let's see what happens, and boom, you can see it right away. It's like very sort of direct manipulation. Or, you know, instead of going to the next chapter in a movie, you might say like, I want to see the next time this actor shows up. You know, find this actor immediately, find it, let me see where they are. Or if there's some actor you don't like, you just remove them from the movie automatically. <laughs> I mean, it, it would be great to be able to do interactive operations on the world's most popular kind of media, which is video. But we can't do this. Okay, so why not? The problem is that processing videos is very computationally expensive. Um, you know, to run a pipeline this on a video can take hours and hours. Uh, so for a, you know, for a 30-minute video, if it's a 4K video, it can take you know many hours to, to process and to render. So how would we fix this? You know, the standard. Oh yes, Ganesh. One quick question. Sure. How is it customer here? Oh, like professionals and. In these movie companies, or is it just regular average Joe? Yeah, the, qu the question is: Is the target customer here sort of professionals in the movie companies, or is it sort of the regular average Joe? You know, I think truthfully, like most things in technology, it, it might start out at the high end and then percolate down. I mean, in the '70s, if you wanted in an interactive word processor, you had to like go to Xerox Park, and there was like four of them. Um, and then, you know, by the '80s, thanks in part to Microsoft, you know, everyone had it. So I think it probably will would, would percolate. Yeah, I would think so. Um, so how would, I mean, if we wanted to do this today, the standard toolbox would be like, you know, let's just throw a whole bunch of silicon at it. Let's just, there's like 10,000 computers. So can you achieve interactive collaborative editing of video by using massive parallelism? The problem is it's not so clear how to do it. The problem number one is that you would need, you know, thousands of threads uh, running in parallel, and they'd have to start up sort of instantly. So you could either have thousands of threads just sitting there waiting for you to do something, which is very expensive, or you need some way to sort of instant start up thousands of threads. So that's problem one. Problem two, however, is that even if you have access to that much uh, parallel compute infrastructure, it's not clear in the problem domain of video how to exploit it. Because um, with the, today's video codecs, the finer grain the parallelism, the worse the compression efficiency. So this is sort of what our uh, work is directed at, is solving those two problems. So we have, number one, a framework to run sort of 5,000 way parallel jobs with inner thread communication, so not sort of embarrassing parallel. There's some inner thread communication on commercial cloud function services, services like AWS Lambda or IBM OpenWhisk or Azure Functions. And then number two, we use this purely functional video codec to allow us to get fine-grained parallelism, finer grain than, than the interval between sort of keyframes, the sort of traditional parallelization interval of video processing. So this whole system we call it X Camera. It was at NSDI last year. So let's just dive into it. The part one is that these cloud function services, they were really intended for sort of microservices or event handlers or sort of asynchronous event handling. You know, a blog post comes in, I guess that's an, I don't know, a tweet comes in and then, you know, fire off some event handler and then, you know, some, something happens. But what we found is that it is possible to spin up tons and tons of them at the same time and they can run sort of arbitrary code. So you can have thousands of threads, you can run an arbitrary executable, they start up in less than a second. And the billing, this is actually a very important point, the billing is also in sub-second intervals. So you're not, it's not like a VM where you're booting the operating system and then paying for sort of a minute minimum. I think when we did this work, Amazon was at an hour minimum. You know, you're paying for a tenth of a second. So you could, if you have an hour of CPU time uh, to use, you could fire up 3,600 threads for one second each. On Amazon, you pay nine cents for that. So, you know, normally, you know, to go from an hour to one second to pay nine cents is a deal I think a lot of people would take. So, um, you know, we built a library to sort of efficiently manage uh, computations on AWS Lambda that have this inner thread comp computation. The main trick is how do you start up thousands of threads in seconds because Amazon's HTTP endpoints are actually quite slow. The answer is if you start up thousands of TCP connections, it works great. So that's, that's the trick. We can end the talk there. So we have that uh, framework, the Mu framework. So that's part one. 
Part two is, okay, now we have the threads. We can start up 5,000 threads in a few seconds. But how do we use uh, that parallelism? And the challenge here is that with existing encoders, the finer grain the parallelism, the worse the compression efficiency. And let's talk about why that is. Okay, so what is a video codec? And it's two things. There's an encoder and a decoder. And the contract here is that pictures come in the left side, a stream of pictures. The encoder turns them into a stream of bits. And then the decoder, if you give it that stream of bits, turns it back into a sort of fuzzy version of the original pictures. This is the, the traditional model. So how does this work? The, way, the reason that video compression is so efficient is that it exploits the similarity between adjacent pictures, adjacent frames of video. So if I was taking a video of you right now, in the first picture that I sent, the first frame, I'd have to send everything. I'd have to send like a JPEG snapshot of, of looking at you folks. But in the subsequent snapshots, I can tell the decoder, I'm the encoder, I tell the decoder, hey, save a copy of the decoded frame, the last decoded frame, and now I'm going to send you a new frame, go back in your memory and look at that decoded frame you have, and I just want you to like, basically, you know, this person is still making the same facial expression as last time, so just copy this block of the image and put it there. I don't have to recode what they look like. In the background, I don't have to recode it. So there's a huge savings in doing that. Uh, in, a, in a 4K video at a sort of typical bit rate, the keyframe, the one that has to stand by itself, is roughly a megabyte. But the subsequent frames are about 40 times smaller. So it's a huge savings from exploiting this temporal redundancy. So the challenge here is that that traditional interface to video encoding, it's based on this stream of pictures. So there's some encode routine that you give it a stream of pictures to, and the result is one keyframe, that's the megabyte, and then a bunch of inner frames. And then on the opposite side, the decoder, you give it a keyframe and a bunch of inner frames, and it produces a bunch of pictures. So if you want to parallelize, let's say we have 200 frames to encode, we could get a keyframe and 199 inner frames. If we want to do it in parallel by dividing up the video frame-wise, you know, the first, frame, the first thread takes 10 frames, it produces one keyframe and nine inner frames. The next thread takes nine, uh, excuse me, 10 frames, produces a keyframe and nine inner frames. The next thread takes, produces a keyframe and nine inner frames, et cetera. Every one of these threads produces a new keyframe that reinitializes the state of the decoder. And every new keyframe is like a megabyte penalty. So the finer grain the parallelism, the more keyframes you have, and therefore the worse compression efficiency. So what is the problem here? Why, do the, why does each encoder want to start with a keyframe? Because it wants to be isolated from the adjacent, the state of the adjacent encoder? Yeah, exactly. The, the state in the system is implicit. So the encoder has no, there's no way to tell the encoder, you know what, start encoding from midstream, and here is the state of the decoder that you can assume that it's in. There's no language to describe the state of the decoder. It's just implicit. And what are the functional programming people? They hate implicit state. You know, if you have state, it should be explicit. So we did that. We formulated this, this internal information, the state of the decoder, and we made it explicit, the state. So we have this model of the video decoder as an automaton. It starts out in a well-known state. It consumes the keyframe. This is the, the compressed coded keyframe. And in doing so, it undergoes a state transition to a new state of the decoder. And that state transition also spits out a picture for display on the screen. Then it consumes an interframe, one of these dependent frames. It also goes through a state transition, but it also spits out a picture for display on the screen. This is our model of the video decoder. And we have an explicit model of what, what the state means. You know, the state is sort of a bunch of pictures from the previous frames that have to be saved for reuse, and a bunch of entropy tables about sort of which bits are more probable in different situations. So in a state transition, uh, the frame takes the decoder from a source state to a target state, and it changes these pictures, it changes the probability tables, and it also spits out some output pictures. This is our model of a video decoder. Yes, sir. In the 4K at 15, at that scenario you described, what's the binary size of one of these states? About 13 megabytes. 13 megabytes. Okay. Um, Can I ask a question? Please. When you talk about state, are there any architectural dependencies in your state about the underlying hardware? Or you're just sort of no is the a high level of abstraction? I mean, the, the short answer is no, because, you know, the, the, the vast bulk of it is just pictures, and pictures are going to be stored in, you know, some YUV raster or something like that. So probably not. I mean, these are, it's 8-bit raster, so even the endianness is not really going to matter. You could imagine someone is little endian or something like that, but I don't think there's a big difference. All right, so what we built was a decoder that is a fully standard decoder for this Google VP8 format and this WebM system. Completely standard, passes the conformance tests but it is written in this purely functional explicit state passing style. So we have a decode function that's a pure function with no side effects. It takes in a state object and a compressed frame, 
And what it outputs is the new state object and a picture for display on the screen. So if you wanted to decode a sequence of frames, you'd have to, the caller would have to save this output state object and then call decode the next time with that value in the next frame and keep feeding it back in. We'd have to thread it through explicitly. I think the smart people call this the monads or something. I don't know what they call it. It doesn't matter. You just call this function a bunch of times. It's not a big deal. So then we built the encoder that can start encoding from midstream. So the encoder, instead of us taking, having the state sort of implicit inside it, evolving as a black box, it takes a state object, that's the state of the decoder, and an image to compress and produces a frame. And that frame is meant to be then applied to the decoder that's in the corresponding state. And finally, we have a transformation operator, a rebase, that takes an interframe that was intended for one state of the decoder, and it adapts it to be applicable to a different state of the decoder. So this is kind of like I see you have a Git sticker on your laptop. This is kind of like what you do in Git. If I have a repository in a particular state, and I ask a thousand software developers to each implement one feature uh, separately, you know, then I'm going to end up with a highly branched series of repositories where they all have a commit that depends on the same state. So what do I need to do next to integrate them back together? I rebase them. I cherry pick each commit, and I make it applicable to a repository that's in a state different from the one it was originally designed for. And the idea is if these uh, commits are not interfering with each other, then that rebase operation is pretty cheap. So we did the equivalent operation for video, where we take a, a compressed frame that's intended for one state of the decoder, and we adapt it to be applicable to a slightly different state. And that's a much cheaper operation than encoding uh, afresh. All right, so the way that we then try and do uh, parallel video encoding is we do as much as possible in parallel. We encode tiny independent chunks. But then in a serial operation, we rebase these chunks together that were encoded in parallel to make them playable in linear order by the decoder. I'll show you what that looks like. So we fire up a whole bunch of threads. Each thread downloads a very short segment of totally uncompressed raw video. So just to give context here, the status quo systems like YouTube, they use chunks of 128 frames, which is about five seconds, a little over five seconds. And so they, they insert a keyframe every 128 frames. That's their amount of parallelism. So we're doing six frames, which is a quarter second. So sort of 20x the parallelism of a system like YouTube. So uh, each one downloads six frames. And the first thing we do is we just encode it the old-fashioned way. So we produce one keyframe and five interframes in each of these chunks. So next, the goal is going to be to then stitch all these together and eliminate all those keyframes. So the first thing we do is we learn the exiting state of each chunk. We figure out what it is. And we send across this thread boundary in, in parallel, we send the exiting state of each chunk to the new thread. That's step one. And then we re-encode this first keyframe, again in parallel, we re-encode it in terms of this exiting state. So that was that encode starting in midstream. Uh, now, unfortunately, we don't have a playable video. Because if you start from here, you end up here. Now you're stuck. You see the problem? There's no way to get uh, finished. So what we have to do is rebase. And this is the first time we end up with a serial operation. All this was in parallel. So now we rebase this chunk to be applicable to this state, which is almost the same, but not, not exactly. And then we rebase this chunk to be applicable to this state, and then this chunk to be applicable to this state. We do that in serial order. So that's the serial part, but hopefully fast. All right, so there's a bunch of different ways to do this. You can have different numbers of frames in each chunk. We're generally using six, and different numbers of chunks rebased together. We're generally using 16, so we end up with a keyframe every four seconds. I'll talk about the evaluation. So the first thing we can look at is just the compression efficiency. So here on the y-axis, we have the quality. And here on the x-axis, we have the average bit rate. So as the bit rate goes up, the quality goes up. So what we see on the blue line is sort of the best you could possibly do. This is the production grade Google single-threaded encoder. And then in the orange here, we have a multi-threaded encoder. Uh, there's some penalty from the threading because they split things up. Um, so then let's look at sort of the dumbest thing we could do which is just encode those separate six-frame chunks and don't rebase them together. So just have a keyframe every quarter of a second. So that's much worse. As the bitrate goes up, the quality is, is much worse. So you, you can see you know, even an individual decibel of, of SM, you can probably see. So now the question is, what happens if you rebase uh, together in these strings of four seconds? You only have a keyframe every four seconds, and it ends up here. Well, so within plus or minus 3% of the Google multi-thread encoder. All right, so let's talk about the performance. Uh, that single thread encoder, the best you could possibly do, for a 15-minute 4K video takes seven and a half hours. Uh, the multi-thread encoder takes two and a half hours. And you can imagine, what if you just had infinite parallelism available to you? So we just took that video, we uploaded it to YouTube. You know, they've got millions of computers. But they can't exploit all the parallelism. They only have these threads of 128 frames each. That took them 37 minutes. 
And when we run it on AWS Lambda, it takes about two and a half minutes and it costs about $5. Yes? So, is there any reason why YouTube uses uh, uh, threads in each of 120 frames? Well, if they use smaller than that, they would pay a, a bigger and bigger compression penalty. And if they use bigger than that, it would just be slower. And it would be harder to seek in the video. But presumably, the damn cost isn't, I mean, they already have those machines. So is there a reason why they're optimizing for cost? Is it just that? I don't think they're optimizing for price necessarily, but the compression efficiency would be worse if they use a smaller granularity. And the, the time to encode would be worse if they used a larger granularity. I think those are the main engineering pressures. But I also doubt they spend $5 on a 15 minute video. That, I don't have that information from them. Yes, sir. Waiting in a queue or anything like that, right? You can't tell. That's no, seven minutes. No, we can't tell. But if you upload this to a commercial service like AWS Cloud Encoder, it's even worse. Yes. So when you're doing rebase, what you're doing is you're taking advantage of the temporal locality of the previous frames to make the first the frame you're rebasing smaller. Uh, yeah, that's right. And I, I, just to go back to the previous question, I mean, AWS Lambda, we could also end up in a queue, just to be clear. I mean, they have a limited uh, population of machines. We have to wait in line to get our, our machines, too. So I think it is a somewhat fair comparison, except that we're spending five bucks, and you know, Google's budget is probably much, much less on a per video basis. So yeah, so the, the way that the, um, you know, when we adapt this keyframe to be an interframe, it gets much, much smaller. Um, yeah, I mean, in practice, you could actually do this at a, at a slice level to keep, to keep like a constant bit rate, right? Or, or are you handling it like by a slice, or how do you handle it when you have like separate eye slices as opposed to separate eye frames? Well, uh, yeah, everything we're doing is at the frame level. Okay, so you have only full eye frame, frame, but you don't have like mixed frames with like eye slices and piece slices. Well, uh, I'm sorry. So with, within a inter frame. Some of the macro blocks are intracoded and some are intercoded, and that's up to the encoder. So we also do the same thing. You know, if you have very fast motion or it's changing a lot, it won't be worth it for the encoder to try and find you know, a similar macro block in the previous frame. So it will just code that block afresh, and that's an intra intra black or black or I slice in the in the H sixty four terminology. Yeah, but my question is when you're like encoding a video to have like constant bit rates, so you don't have like these spikes of high frames being very mm -hmm. high and then different being very small. What some encoders do is to encode parts of the frame like a, 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 a stripe as a, as a full iframe, and the, the rest of the video will be kind of like a B frame. So you can have a, an average constant bit rate. Yeah, we're not, we're not doing that. We're, uh, we're, and here we're just looking at the average bit rate over the whole video. Um, can, you, can you go back a couple to where you just were? Um, sure, sure. In this scenario, are each of these threads a separate AWS function instance? Yes. Are they actually doing IPC with each other? Uh, both, both, yes. They are separate. They're separate Lambda workers, and they're doing IPC with each other. And is there in this serial stage an issue with the reliability of that? Like, if one of them dies in the middle, do you you're able to rerun that one only and continue the serial path? Or well, so in the last that? system I talk about, if I uh, get to it, we will have that. In this system, we don't have any sort of reliability story. But the truth is, the truth is, is we fire up all these lambdas, and then we just wait for them to get in contact with us and request work. And the truth is that among the lambdas that actually wake up and request work, the later failures are, is extremely rare. Um, most of the time when we see a failure is that Amazon bills us and like think, claims to have invoked a lambda, but we never ever hear from it. Uh, that's the failure mode we see. So if you just wait for them to get in contact with you, that eliminates the, the bulk of the failures. Yes? So oh, I don't have much knowledge about what sort of information would be in the states of the interframes, but naively one might think that hey, while you're um, rebasing thread 2 onto thread 1's output, in parallel you could rebase thread 4 onto thread 3 and so forth and get some kind of login thing. Can you talk about why that doesn't get you any gain? Well, we might just not be smart enough to do that, um, but we haven't figured out a way to do that. And, and the reason is that you know, to rebase thread 3 onto thread 2, we have to know this state exactly. Uh, but then the rebasing operation changes all of these states, including this one. So we only learn this exiting state of the chunk after we've done the rebase. And so we, if you had done that other merge, you're saying it would then be twice as much work when you had to rebase the thread 3, thread 4 output. That's onto. right. Okay. That's right, yeah. There may be some clever approach here, but we haven't found it. All right. So... Um, so the lesson here is that I believe that this, this service that the cloud operators are now offering, where you can rent uh, you know, 5,000 cores for a few seconds, uh, is very powerful and I think has sort of unexploited value. We went up to see Amazon, well, here. We went here to see Amazon, and uh, we talked to them about this. And they, they still they didn't, 
We're like, it's amazing, it's so wonderful. And they're like, now, you know, and we said, can you increase our quota? You know, we want even more parallel threads. You know, 5,000 is not enough. And they said, well, how many do you need? How many requests per second do you get? And we said, well, it doesn't really work like that. Like, usually we're doing nothing, but then when, when, when we have a job, we want as many as they'll give us. Like, can we have a million? And they're like, a million per second? I was like, no, 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 no. Most of the time we're not doing anything, but occasionally we're going to want a million concurrently, but only for five seconds each. And they, they don't want to say that they don't have the capacity, but they also don't say yes uh, to that request. Uh, but, you know, I really believe any time you have a program where there's a button that's, you know, going to take an hour to do something, uh, you know, machine learning training. We can imagine a lot of tasks that take a lot of time. There should just be another button next to it that says do it in one second and pay nine cents. Uh, it would be a very powerful extraction. And, you know, you can imagine this for image and video filters uh, across the video or 3D artists. At DreamWorks, when they want to decide where the light should be over Shrek, um, it takes them four hours to render a frame. And the, the, the utilization guys say, oh, that's okay because we keep our cluster fully utilized. We have a process of each frame in the video. We can render the whole movie in four hours. But that doesn't help you if the artist, you're the artist and you want to see a particular frame. It still takes you four hours. So the extent we can burst um, uh, you know, is very powerful in, in compilation and sort of software testing. Imagine running all your tests in one second or sort of interactive machine learning or database queries or visualization or genomics or search. There's all kinds of things that would be very powerful to do if you could burst sort of general purpose tasks uh, to 10,000 cores for a few seconds. Yes, sir. I mean... To be fair, this is a really hard problem. Amazon and I've had the same frustration trying to run things on Azure Functions. They are building these things out of VMs and out of all the boring stuff we have already. And so the way they can give you X thousand in a, in a second is by having lots of idle machines sitting around waiting for your workload. Yes. And if you ask to be able to burst to a million at once, they're going to have to have a lot more idle machines ready to take that load. And it's going to cost you a lot more. Yeah, well, partly this is why Amazon and you are in a good position to do this, because they can statistically multiplex among many diverse kinds of customers. Whereas if I wanted to set up this service, I'm the only person that would be using it. There, um, there, there is a challenge in the multiplexing, which is, which is the security. Uh, if different customers don't trust each other, yeah. generally, from a security standpoint for a cloud provider, the only story that people are willing to accept is a VM level isolation story. All right, well now we know- That's a very expensive proposition. Okay, but now we know where the problem is because security of containerized infrastructure is a problem that you and I and everyone in this room can work on. It's a well-defined right. problem. Agree. Yes. And the people that trust VM level virtualization are silly anyway. Well, that's not so great, as we all know. You think it's great? I, I think it's better than container level isolation. Yeah. I'm not arguing that, that point. Is that because it's the devil you know or because it's a better devil? It has a, 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 smaller, a smaller attack surface. Okay. That's the main thing. Okay. Uh, I think it's an exciting problem, but you're right, it's a problem. All right, let me try and get through the rest of the talk. Um, so that was, that was f functionalization technique number one, is getting more parallelism out of video encoding. So I'm going to talk about functionalization number two, which is trying to adapt to the needs of a pre-existing distributed file system. So here it's more about robustness and reliability. Okay, so this was also at NSDI last year. This is with my colleague at Dropbox, who were at MIT and Stanford. Okay, so the problem here is if you run a Dropbox-like service, uh, you make all these deals with people, and oh, I did check the public box, didn't I? Well, anyway, if you run a Dropbox-like service, you have a wonderful company, and you are storing a lot of other people's files. And if you look at what those files are, you will see like over a third of them are JPEGs. It's like a third JPEGs, a third videos, and a third other. Um, you have, if you drop actually like an exabyte in storage, you're paying a lot of money to keep these hard drives running. Can you save backend space? Because you know, these JPEGs, you can probably guess, what is the median download count of a file in Dropbox? Excellent. Yeah, one. I think it's zero. It's zero. Because the common pattern is you have an auto uploader, but you no one ever looks at the file. I think the median view count of a video on YouTube is zero. Uh, most people never tweet, they just read celebrities. The internet really doesn't, no, no one writes anything, they just read like other people's things. So uh, you can see why a company that runs a big file system, a consumer file system, would be interested in compressing back in space, because no one's ever going to read it anyway. And uh, a lot of people have had this idea, and if you look at the way JPEG works, it, it seems like you could do it, because there's sort of a three-layer pancake in JPEG. There's a lossless step where you transform the brightness and the colors, then there's a lossy step. This is the crucial step where you actually throw away information. You quantize the, the luma and the chroma, the brightness and the color, to some limited precision. And then there's another lossless step at the bottom of the pancake where you just take those quantized weights, quantized activations, and you just write them out in some efficient way. So the more popular numbers are supposed to have fewer numbers of bits. So the question would be, can I just take out the bottom layer of this pancake, this Huffman code, 
and replace it with some more efficient technique that was invented, or at least came off patent since JPEG was standardized. So a lot of people have done this. Uh, you replace this DC predicted Huffman code with an arithmetic code, which is a more sophisticated technique that was patented when the JPEG standard came out. And then the only hard part is, how accurately can you predict whether the next bit is a 1 or a 0? Because the arithmetic code gives you almost exact information theoretic uh, loss function. So if you're absolutely sh sure that the next bit is a 1 and it turns out to be a 0, you know, that takes infinite bits to encode. If you're sure it's going to be a 1 and it is a 1, that takes no bits to encode. So if you can predict with good accuracy what the next bit is, you know, of course, if, you're, if you think it's 50-50, then if it's a 1 or a 0, it takes 1 bit to encode. So the, the more accurately you can predict what the next bit is, the more savings you can have. But if you make a gamble and you're wrong, it's a big penalty. All right, so a lot of people have done this before. So you can reorganize the coefficients to make them more similar and therefore more compressible. And that gets you sort of a 6 or 7% compression savings, but you can decode it very quickly. You can also strip out the DC predicted Huffman code and use an arithmetic code uh, with a sort of normal probability model that was, uh, you know, people have agreed on. So that gets you maybe a 13% uh, compression, but it's slower to decompress. Or you can be a crazy German person and you can sort all the coefficients in the whole file and then have a huge model, like 100,000 coefficients, and then an arithmetic code. And that gets you like 23% compression efficiency, but it's very, very slow because there's all these global operations. So if you're Dropbox, it's not going to work for you because they don't have the whole file in one place. They have this distributed file system where the blocks of the file are sharded based on their hash and then independently uh, distributed. So there's a client here, and the client goes out to these different file servers, and it requests or it stores different byte ranges of a JPEG file. So for the client to reassemble the file, it has to go out to different file servers and get a different block from each one. So what you'd really want is to replace the shard of the file on each server with a compressed file, lepton file, that represents the corresponding block. And then when the, when the client requests it, it should just get the decompressed block. Anything else is not really a viable way to deploy because you can't upgrade all the clients in the world to become aware of your compression format and all the, not all the clients of the same programming language or platform. So it really has to be sort of transparent block-by-block -block operation on the file system. All right, so the problem here, you know, if you're a big company, is you want to store and decode the file in independent chunks. They have to be able to start at any byte offset because the, you know, I don't control the file system sharding algorithm. You have to be able to get sort of greater than 100 megabits per second decoding speed or else like there's some news story that Dropbox just got 10 times slower to save money. That's not good. And they're very concerned to not lose any data. So this whole system has to be immune to any sort of adversarial or pathological evil JPEG. Every time the program is changed, they run it on a billion files with three different compilers. And the three compilers have to agree with each other and agree with the true input before they're willing to deploy it. Even so, by the way, there's been problems. Um, yeah, I said all that. Okay. So the question here is, when the client retrieves a chunk of a file, how does the file and server re-encode that chunk from our compressed format back to the JPEG format? Well, the answer here, you sh it's the same as the previous answer. Let's do it in functional programming style, where the JPEG encoder, that DC predicted Huffman entropy encoder, is written in, is a pure function with no side effects uh, whose state is supplied explicitly. And that allows us to start encoding from midstream, just like before. We want to be able to tell the, the, the JPEG encoder, hey, the, the decoder is already in this state, the state left behind by the previous file system block. That's where they are. They were at that up byte offset. So you need to start encoding Huffman code words, assuming that the decoder is in a particular state. So we had to reason about what is the state, the byte by byte state of the Huffman encoder. It's not actually that complicated. So the, the, the real challenge here is that the byte offsets, there's no reason for them to be in the middle of a Huffman code word. You know, the Huffman code word can be 17 bits, and the byte offset could be 14 bits into it. So what you have to remember is, how many bits into it am I? And what are the bits uh, in the current byte that I was supposed to write out, but I haven't yet, because I don't have a full byte? And also, there's this um, DC prediction. So it's, you subtract out the average value. So I have to remember what those average values are. So it's actually not that complicated. The state is 16 bytes. This was a much easier problem than the video encoding. Video, we had to reason about these big states, and there's a lot of different probability tables, very complicated. JPEG, not complicated. We just had to honestly come up with a test suite and then just keep trying to get the state smaller and smaller uh, so we'd understand it. And, you know, there's all kinds of... The problem is when the, you know, when the specification is written, they don't talk about scope or sort of what the minimal state is. They say there's this variable and this variable, and you know, it turns out you can derive one variable from the other, so you can make the state small. It was a fun project to do, but it was not that uh, complicated. So ultimately, if you do this, you can, you can shard the file across different file system blocks. You can also shard the file within a file system block to be able to have a parallel decoder. So just within a certain a particular file system block, not even talking about the benefits of distribution, we end up here. 
So we end up with almost the same, not quite, but almost the same compression efficiency as the German guy, but uh, much better decoding performance because we can split it up into little pieces and do them in parallel. All right, so uh, as of when I last learned, we had compressed 200 petabytes of JHABIC files. We saved 46 petabytes. And they decided, someone ran the numbers and decided it's economical to go to the full back catalog, all the 350 petabytes or whatever they have, and start compressing them. So they're doing that at like 6,000 images per second. There's a cluster dedicated to this program. And you can see the cluster is consuming about 280, um, what is this, kilowatts. And then at one point, they suspected there was a bug, and they turned off the program, and it went down to like 140 kilo, uh, kilowatts. And then eventually the program was exonerated, they turned it back on again. So what's interesting here is that there is a cluster running this program that consumes 300 kilowatts, but like half of that is running like the CPU fan and the LEDs on the front of the computer. Like this is the empirical efficiency of compression, is that like half of it is like not, it doesn't matter if you're running the program or not. So there's a problem here for not me, someone else, to think about like how do we more efficiently make use of computing resources? Because it seems silly you turn the program off, you're still paying half the, half the energy price. I'm sure this is, what, what is the ratio in uh, Azure? Is it better? Is that an I know, but I won't tell you, or it's like that's a crazy question to ask? The oh, I have is, no idea. That's okay, yeah. That's right. Right. Somebody knows. Someone knows. knows. All right. But right. They probably won't tell you. That's fine. Well, I. <laughs> well, great. I'm telling you for Dropbox, it's you know whatever this is. This is in the paper, and if you have a great solution, well, I. I just just my architecture community is, is. They're on this. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Well, then us, whatever community we are, we can know that they're not doing a very good job yet. Okay. Okay, great. So the lesson here, a little bit of functional programming can go a long way. We're talking about 16 bytes as the state that allows you to resume encoding the JPEG file from anywhere. That turns out to be a powerful thing. It saves them, like, I don't know, a lot of money. So, in fact, there are all these stories about Dropbox saving all this money and, like, 16 bytes. It's not such a big deal. But we had to get over our fear of something that seems like it should be opaque, the JPEG encoder. And if you just, like, set up a test suite where you just say, like, are these two files the same or not on decoding, and then just start mucking around with it, it's actually not that hard to start fooling around with it. So if we're willing to take these mega modules, like a codec, and split them up into this explicit state passing style, um, great dividends can be earned. That's, that's the point here. All right, yes, sir? Um, so maybe this question is actually a little bit more about the, the camera than, than the lepton part. But sure. um, when you have an existing implementation of a codec that has not been built in this functional style, yes. and you want to build the functional version, do you throw it out and start from scratch, or do you take your existing reference implementation and think about how to sort of reverse engineer functionality into it, or like what's, what's the general? I think that's a great question. Um, and the truth is that we've done it both ways. So in the X-Camera project, we did build our codec from scratch. Um, I mean, I did that with my students. Um, in the Lepton project, because it was like at a real company, we, we didn't. We took an existing JPEG encoder and we transformed it to be functional, which I think is probably what you'd normally do in the industry. You, if you could avoid writing it from scratch, maybe you would. Um, I, I mean, I, honestly, I, I don't think either one was a clear winner in terms of like productivity or software engineering best practice. Um, I, I think this approach was not, it wasn't that bad. Um, we had to sort of find the function that's actually doing the writing, and we had to sort of lift it out of this, you know, they have some inner loop that's like for i equals, you know, the top row to the bottom row, and then the left column to the right column. So they have some loop that they're going over, and we had to sort of lift that out. I mean, and just, we had to ask, what is the inner state of the loop that you actually care about? Because uh, you have all these local variables that are evolving. So let's, can we write down the minimal set of local variables that matter, and then can I write a function that just takes those variables explicitly and does one bit of it. And then you can put it back in the, as a stage in the loop and make sure it still works. And then once you know it works, you can take it out of the loop because now you understand the state. So I think you can do it both ways. But for the video encoding thing, where the implementations are perhaps a bit larger and more complicated, do you think that the, that, that retrofitting approach would be feasible or do you think it's just like... So I think for someone who truly understood the VP8 format and the, and the codec implementation, I think retrofitting would be feasible. But for us, the only way that we could understand it was by implementing it in a clean way. So now that we've actually implemented it, I think we could now go and retrofit Google's implementation. But there's no way we could have done that at the beginning. Yes? So how much of this is because Hoffman coding was suitable to do this? And how, like, do you have a sense of if I take out Hoffman coding and replace it with something else, you can still do this or not? 
Well, is the question, can you still get the compression efficiency or can you still parallelize? Can you still parallelize? Well, I mean, the, the reason it was so easy to parallelize is that the state is something you can write down relatively concisely, like 16 bytes. Um, if the state was really large, we can still parallelize, but we wouldn't get the compression efficiency. So I guess what we needed, you know, we, we needed a sort of concise state because the goal here is compression and performance. So if you had some very complicated encoder state, yeah, I guess we wouldn't be able to do it. Like, um, well, for video, for example, if we had to parallelize the video at any byte boundary, uh, I don't think we'd get a gain because the, the state within a frame is very big. So yeah. since it was about 13 megabytes of state in the X camera case, what was the computation to um, communication ratio in terms of you know overlapping the available six frame compute bandwidth? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a great question. Um, I mean, the, the bulk of the communication in X camera is in downloading those raw frames from S3, because those are totally uncompressed raw 4K frames, and we download six of them. Um, but, you know, the communication within Amazon's cloud is very fast. It's, you know, close to 10 gigabits. So uh, moving all the states around, both moving the states around from Lambda to Lambda and downloading is pretty fast. So right. the computation is really the, the burden. I'm just wondering about um, in terms of how optimized they are for this scenario of like burst communication among many lambdas at once in their network fabric. And yeah, so let me say, we have this graph in the paper, and I think I have it in my backup slides. The communication is not the part that's taking the time. It's really the computation. Yes, sir? So actually, more for X camera, do you have any idea of whether there's an impact in the actual quality of the image after doing rebase, for example, compared to the original video? Well, we. We quantify that. I mean, I showed that graph. No, but like, that's like the, the, the compression, like the bitrate, right? But like the quality, like something like no, but the quality was on the y-axis. I can go. I'll go back to that. <coughs> so here's here's the graph I'm talking about. Oh, I see. So the quality is on the y-axis. So it, you know, it, it ends up close to the sort of parallel state of the art. Okay. Thanks. All right. Okay, so let's talk about system number three, where there's yet another benefit to the sort of functional style, which is in real-time video encoding, being able to explore an execution path of the encoder without committing to it. So here the problem is in uh, video conferencing. So let's look at this clip. So this is my student just gave this talk at NSDI two days ago. So here is actual Chrome 65 WebRTC when the network gets bad. So look at what happens. It just freezes, and now the network is better, and it's still frozen, still frozen, sort of recovering, and okay, it's finally back. We can watch that again, or you, you got the idea the first time? All right. So this is like state of the art. There's like lots of people working on this. This is the flagship WebRTC reference implementation in the latest Google Chrome browser. It just does not handle network variability very well. And uh, the reason is, partly is that it doesn't track these, um, these variations in network speed. So you can see when the network gets bad and good again, that's the pink part. Uh, you know, WebRTC keeps sending when the network is bad. That provokes packet loss or it provokes queuing delay. And then the encoder gets just like totally confused. Like the video doesn't resume until almost here. I think it was even maybe at four. It just gets confused. It's like, it seems to have been written in a way that they, they, they can't recover quickly from network glitches. Yes, Ganesh. What is sure. The, the of the in the sense, and what's the optimal point in time that it should have recovered? Well, the, the, I mean, they, the encoder chooses the bit rate to encode to. Uh, so here it's encoding at about three megabits per second. And then by the end, it's really not. There's no video at all. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't recover until much later. We can see, well, there's a graph in the paper we can see where it's just, there's no frames displayed at all. I mean, we're picking on WebRTC because it's the worst one, but it's also like the great hope of the internet. So, so we have, uh, so anyway, what we, what we argue in the paper is that the problem here is that the video codec is off in one place, and the transport protocol is often another place. And there's people, computer scientists, networking people, you know, like me who work on the transport protocol. And there's faraway people, like in Europe or an EE department, that work on the video codec. And they both have their own control loop. And what we have is a new architecture, a tightly controlled, a jointly controlled architecture, where we jointly control the frame by frame rate control decisions of the video codec and the packet by packet congestion control decisions of the transport protocol in one control loop to try and do a better job. So we have this video aware transfer protocol, we have this functional video codec, and the goal is to then respond quickly to network glitches and recover quickly after a network glitch. The bottom line, we get 
uh, four and a half times lower delay and about 60% better picture quality than the average of FaceTime, Hangouts, Skype, and WebRTC. And that's with and without scalable or layered video encoding. So the idea here is the way the sort of status quo systems work, including Skype or Hangouts or FaceTime, is that the video code, you know, the transfer protocol has some estimate, um, some available bandwidth estimate about how fast the network is. And it sends a, it gives a target, oh, I just lost my laser. That's okay. It gives a target bit rate to the video codec. And the video codec chooses some encoding parameters, like a quality and some number of frames per second, and then spits out compressed frames back to the transfer protocol. Uh, the problem here is these sort of operate separately. So if the transport, uh, if the video codec generates a frame that's too big, the transfer protocol kind of has to send it. Even if the transfer protocol knows, like, that frame is too big, it is going to congest the network. In WebRTC, they will send it anyway. And then they will say, you know, we've probably just congested the network. Let's pause frames on input to the video codec for a while to give the network a chance to recover. It would be better to just not send the bad frame in the first place. But why can't they do that? What happens if the encoder is spitting out frames and we just, the transport we just cancel one of those frames and don't send it? What's going to happen? The subsequent frames can't be decoded. Yeah, exactly. The subsequent frames won't be decodable. They'll be either badly decoded or won't be decoded at all. There's no way to tell the video codec, like, hey, you remember that uh, execution path you just went down? Forget about it. Back up and let's pretend that that frame didn't get sent. So what we have here in our system is an integrated one control loop where every frame we consult both the transfer protocol and the video codec, uh, and we go around the loop. So let's talk about the transfer protocol part of it first. Um, we want to ask, what should be the size of the next frame? So the transfer protocol has an has a estimator for this. We call it like a congestion window in the networking literature. And so that's how big the next frame should be. Um, and we measure this based on sort of the inter-arrival time, how fast packets are coming in. There's no notion of a bit rate here, or sort of an average rate. There's just a congestion window. This is how sort of like TCP AIMD works, or TCP cubic. Um, and we try and do this, I don't have maybe time for this, but we try and do this in a video aware way. So previous schemes for adaptive bit rate, uh, excuse me, available bandwidth estimation, the problem is if the encoder pauses in the middle, the uh, receiver can think, oh, well, I didn't get any packets for a while, the network must be slow. You can get a pessimistic estimate of the network speed if the sender is not full throttle. You know, normally when people evaluate TCP, it's like FTP or something, like downloading a big file where there's a full throttle sender. So if you don't have a full throttle sender, then uh, you can get confused. So we have this idea of a grace period where the time in between frames is explicitly encoded and the receiver can pause inference in the middle and say, well, I wasn't expecting frames. Yeah? Why it's not enough to keep the sun buffer full at all times is because TCP is not aware of the frame boundaries, is that it? Or no, I would say you don't want to keep a buffer at the sender side because that's going to add delay. No, but if you fill the sun buffer, then shouldn't the uh, TCP window size be enough to adapt to network uh, variability? Um, so I, I would, hmm. so I would say, again, I, you don't want to have a buffer on the send side. You only want to be sending a frame when it's ready to go straight out the network. So if, if you're hanging on to packets at the sender side, you should have just waited to encode a later frame off the camera. Is that? OK, yeah. And, and, and to be clear, all these programs, Skype and FaceTime and Hangouts, they're all using UDP with their own sort of custom congestion control. All right, so that was the transfer protocol. The video codec also, the problem here is that even if we have a congestion window, we know what size the next frame should be, that it can go right out. It doesn't have to wait in a, a sender side buffer. No video codec can accurately hit a particular size target for an individual frame. Because the only way you learn the compressed size of the frame is to try and compress it. Then you sort of learn after the fact how big it was. So the strategy here that we'd want to do would be, let's just try some trial and error. You know, Let's try a little better quality setting, a little worse quality setting. Let's see how it works out. The problem is it's not hard to do that with an existing codec. Because if you ask it to uh, encode a frame, the encoder goes through a state transition. And the next frame is going to, as the gentleman in the back said, the next frame is going to assume that that frame was received. And so uh, it's hard to say, well, you know, encode a good frame, and then, oh, forget you did that. Now encode a bad frame based on the same state. There's no API for that. So uh, in our system, there is an API for that. It's the same one as before. You can encode given a state. So we can encode a branch. We can encode two different possible compressed frames given the same decoder state. So that's basically the strategy here. Um, at every uh, time around the control loop, we ask the encoder to encode a slightly higher quality version of the last successful frame and a slightly lower quality version of the last successful frame. And that gives the application three options, uh, depending on what the estimate is for the congestion window. It can send the good one, it can send the bad one, or it can say, you know what, I don't like either of those options. They're both too big. Let's just not send a frame this time around. 
And that's something you can't really do with a conventional codec API. You can't say, you know, just forget about it. So if you look at the way this works, uh, the way the congestion window evolves, you know, let's say it's 30 kilobytes right now. There's some better option, some worse option. We're going to send, which one are we going to send right now? The worst option. All right. So we send the worst option because that's the one that fits. It has to fit within the congestion window. So the, the better one was too big. So we send the worst option. All right. That's good. Now next time, uh, the target frame size you know, is, is bigger. So we can send the better option. All right. And next time, uh, the target frame size is maybe really small. So what are we going to do now? Because we have this ability to explore an execution path without committing to it, we can just cancel it. We say, you know what? I don't like either of those options. And the next time the encoder encodes a frame, it does it relative to the frame that actually got sent. So these options, it's like they never happened. We just encode a new frame. So what you can see here is that the frame rate is totally dynamic. There's not like a fixed frame rate. The frames only get sent when the network can accommodate them. So there's just a gap here. But it's much better to do it like this on the output than on the input where you've already encoded frames. Yes, sir? Is it not likely that as you skip frames, the delta is going to get larger? Oh, which, oh, well, yes, the delta will get larger. That, that absolutely will happen. Yeah. But uh, it's still better than congesting the network. Yes? How are you getting the target frame size? Uh, Basically target? using Sprout. Yeah, the transfer protocol comes up with it. You may be mistaken. That's true. That's true. Uh, but, you know, AIMD, I mean, any congestion control algorithm can be, can be mistaken. But this is something we can improve. All right. So uh, to evaluate this system, we built what may be the first one. Uh, I don't know if it's the first one. It's the first one that we know of to try and do reproducible end-to-end -end tests of black box video conferencing systems. So the goal is to have a reproducible input video, reproducible network traces, and run unmodified versions of Skype, FaceTime, Hangouts, and Chrome. Uh, and then measure the, the quality of each frame and the delay of each frame. So the students built this system where we have an expensive HDMI input-output card that has a hardware clock that timestamps each frame as it goes out and when it comes in. And we simulate a webcam. So we have this barcoded video uh, of an actual webcam, conf you know, a video conference. We put a barcode at 60 frames per second on each frame so we can find the frame later. We send it out. We pretend to be a webcam. And we get this USB plug that looks like it's a webcam. We can plug it into a Mac running uh, FaceTime or a PC running Skype. And we, it, it thinks it's a webcam. We run it through the sender, through our uh, network emulator, which is synchronized with the video to, to a receiver. We full screen the video on the receiver. It goes out the HDMI port back into the uh, HDMI capturer, uh, which is timestamped with the same hardware clock. And then we just recognize the barcode. So here's a frame coming out. You can see the barcode here. Here's the same frame coming back. You can see the barcode is still decodable, even though it's a pretty messy video. And so we can get the timestamp when it came back, because we match with the barcodes, and we could get the quality of the output frame relative to the input frame. We do this for every single frame. So if we look at the results, uh, again, quality is on the y-axis here, and delays on the x-axis, and we flip the x-axis, so the lower delays are here to the right. All right, so here's sort of Skype and WebRTC with and without the scalable video coding and FaceTime and Hangouts. So the first thing we did was try and just match the status quo. So we wrote our own video conferencing tool with our toolkit, our codec, that tries to work the way that we think the existing ones do, with these sort of separate control loops. And we ended up right here. That's our attempt to approximate the status quo. The next thing we did was keeping the codec the same, not functional, but improving the transport protocol. So we took this sort of Sprout protocol uh, that I published a while ago, uh, you know, sort of simpler version of that. And we tried to have frame-by-frame -frame control of the uh, size of each uh, that each frame should be, but with a conventional codec where it, it can't sort of encode the multiple options and see what works best. And that ended up over here. So we get lower delay because we have this new transfer protocol, but we're, we don't have very good quality and we're still using this conventional codec. So then we swapped out the conventional codec for our functional, purely functional explicit state passing style codec that can skip a frame when necessary and can, in, can encode the higher and the lower quality version and pick them after the fact, and that ends up here. So we end up, this is a student-written codec. It's one graduate student, but it's getting better quality than production quality H.265 uh, encoders. And this suggests that you know, in, the, in this problem, further improvement in codecs may have reached the point of diminishing marginal returns. But improvement in video systems, I think, still has a lot of low-hanging fruit. So this is on a Verizon-like network. Here's an AT&T LTE trace. Again, we're here. Here's a T-Mobile UMTS trace. We can also look at networks that don't have any variability, but just have sort of fixed conditions but occasional loss, like a Wi-Fi link, we're over here. So we're not getting the quality benefits, but we still get the delay benefits. And we can look at what it looks like. Here I have a little, uh, I have some movies. So here's the same one we've seen before, but now Salsify is on the left. 
You can see as the network deteriorates, they both freeze, but then SalsaV recovers right away. And WebRTC is still frozen, still frozen. It's getting there, it's getting there, and now it's recovered. So you can see you can recover much more quickly. Here's a different video where we look at episodes of packet loss. So SalsaV is on the left, and we're going to see some packet loss now. They both die, but SalsaV is recovered. WebRTC is still frozen, and it's recovered. And we'll try it again. All right, SalsaV is back. WebRTC is still frozen. There it recovers. And one more time, SalsaV recovers. Chrome is still frozen. One more time. So you get the idea here. So they're just not able to adapt uh, the control fast enough to recover when there's an episode of packet loss. Yes, sir? Is this something you can build on top of a hardware decoder, or you have to build it in CPU? We believe you could build it on top of a hardware decoder, but the hardware decoder might also have to allow you to export its state. Mm -hmm. So I mean, we really want the API. Whether it's software or hardware is not our fight. All right. So uh, the code's open source. We have a nice website. We're on Reddit today, so that's how you know we've really made it. Uh, but ultimately, the, the point here is by jointly controlling the video codec and the transfer protocol and using this functional abstraction to be able to match what the codec can do to the capabilities of the network, both when to send a frame and how big it should be, we end up with dramatic gains over sort of the status quo separate design. All right? Do we have time to do the fourth part? Uh, yeah, we could, we could go on. All right, or we can take, take questions here. There's several of us that came for the fourth part. Oh, the fourth part. Okay, great. Let's do it. Okay. So... You know, we have this powerful abstraction, uh, a function, and this powerful service, these functions of service computing. So if you're going to be dividing up things up into little functions and running them on other people's infrastructure, how can we make this sort of easy to program? So if you look at systems like RX Camera, and then Berkeley had one called Pyren, um, the problem is that they ask programmers to commingle, you know, the algorithm. What is it I want to compute? And then the schedule, like what gets paralyzed and what gets run when? And then also like the execution engine and the execution platform, like, you know, there's some API call to invoke Lambda and OpenWhisk and whatever. So it seems kind of unfortunate to commingle these things together because it means like if you write a program that's targeting Lambda and you want to then adapt it to you know, Azure Functions or OpenWhisk, like this is all uh, tied together. And what if you want to try some different schedule or run it on a different hardware where there's a different amount of parallelization? These really shouldn't be tied together. If you think about systems like Halide or LLVM, you know, the great success is by uh, having an abstraction boundary where it makes sense to do it. Having, in Halide's case, between the algorithm and the schedule and LLVM between sort of the front end and then the back end and the optimization passes so that I can implement a new language on LLVM and take advantage of their optimizers and their, their back end code generators. So can we do this? Can we come up with a general intermediate representation for this Lambda style granular computing where someone else who wants to write an application that can parallelize across 10,000 threads, they don't have to worry about the, the back end or the, the scheduler. So our approach here is just try and capture everything that you might want to do at a stage of the comp computation in, what we, in a thunk. So in the functional programming literature, a thunk is a parameterless closure. It's a, it's a little container of a, some code and some data. So, uh, you know, there's some, so in our world, everything is sort of content addressed. So a thunk is a codelet, which is named by its, the hash of its code, which for us is just an x86-64 executable, and then the named data that it'll be applied to. So I'm going to apply this function to this data, and everything's named by the hash, just like in Git or something like that. And it ends up being a sort of microcontainer where the function is not allowed to access anything outside the named data. So dev random is totally out. Can, talking over the network is totally out. Any sort of undeclared I.O. is totally uh, not allowed. The only thing it can do is read the blobs that are declared in the, as arguments to the function. And the blobs are named by their, their content hash. So if you can do this abstraction, if you can compile things into this abstraction, then you can instantiate the microcontainer you know, on Lambda, on OpenWhisk, on your own computer, on EC2, on Azure, whatever you want and you get the same answer. You can even imagine outsourcing it to sort of crazy people on Reddit, and people come back to you and they say, I ran function x on data y, and the answer is z. Um, it's sort of the, everyone gets the same answer. So the, our sort of flagship application is software compilation, where the idea is we model the operations of pre-processing, compiling, assembling, linking, and sort of archiving, and we'd run an existing makefile, uh, and the makefile would run you know, GCC and AR and, and the linker and all these things, except it wouldn't really run the real programs, it would run models that know how to predict what, what dependencies those programs would need at runtime. And if you can predict the dependencies, you can write a thunk. Uh, you, you know, the, the model for the compiler can say, well, I'm not actually going to compile anything, but in the future, I promise you, I'm going to take the compiler, which is a blob of code, and I'm going to apply it to the source code file. You're also going to need this include file. And if you have those blobs, you can do the operation later. 
That's a thunk. It's sort of a, a future with no dependencies. So you might ask, what about like a dynamic task graph? And you know, systems like Dryad, obviously this is not in sort of new territory here. Uh, you know, what if you want to detect faces in a bunch of pictures, which could be between zero and n faces, and then in parallel recognize each face. But you don't know up front how many faces there's going to be. Well, you can imagine, okay, let's just have an API call to spawn a new task. So there's one task that runs and detects faces and then spawns in parallel a task to recognize each face. I don't want to do that because that's sort of language dependent. I have to actually have an API binding that's like spawn a new task. And how do you cache that? If you have some task running on a Lambda that now wants to spawn another task, how does it get access to the cache? You know, how do I name that subprocess invocation? So we're, we're saying you can't do that. You can only have IO with the sort of named blobs. And if you want to have dynamism, Tail recursion is the only mechanism. So if you have some task that, that wants to farm out to an unknown number of other tasks, it has to return a thunk. And that thunk can list as many parallel dependencies as, they, as you want, and they get forced recursively. But this is our mechanism for enabling dynamism in a language independent way is that the thunk just writes out another thunk. So you have one thunk that detects the faces, and what it returns would not be you know, the faces, it would be a thunk that could list uh, the recognizer running on as many regions of the image as it wants. And then that, that, that's then a named thunk, and then we can run it again uh, and look it up in the cache. So that's our abstraction. Tail recursion is the only mechanism for dynamism. Um, so we can look at sort of the, the graphs for like a compilation. Here's the graph for part of GNU hello. So you can see there's you know, source code files. Here's hello.c, and those are the dependencies for preprocess files, and then those are the linear dependencies for assembled files, and those become object files, and then they get uh, some, there's some libraries, they get linked together, and they get stripped. So we get these task graphs. Or we can do it for video encoding, same thing. The X camera I showed you, we can also compile that into this same intermediate representation. Here's what it actually looks like. We have like a protobuf document that describes the thunk. So there's some function or the named codelet, codelet, and then there's some you know some blobs with named blobs. So let's uh, I guess okay, so let's yeah, let's look at the demo because assume that's where we're here. Let's see if this will work. Okay, so here is so here's FFmpeg. This is a popular open source tool for video encoding. Um, and we could make it if we wanted to, and it would look like that. Take like 10 minutes or so. We're just compiling a bunch of files. What if we wanted to do this in parallel in the cloud? Just rent you know, 1,000 machines or 2,000 machines and do it as fast as possible. So instead of actually compiling it, I'm going to run the same make, I guess I'll run parallel, the same make program, but I'm going to infer the thunks. So I'm prepending this gg infer here. Is this big enough? I can make this bigger. We're going to infer the thunk. So this is going to run the same make file as before, but it's going to change the path so that when the make file tries to run the preprocessor or the compiler or the assembler or the linker or AR or random or strip, it's instead running models of those programs that just know enough to be dangerous. They just know enough to say, if I was really going to compile this file, here is the source code file I would need. Here is the preprocess file I would need. Um, and of course, the, the dependency could be a real dependency, but in many cases, it doesn't actually know, you know, the Compiler is running on a preprocess file, but the preprocessor hasn't actually happened yet. So the name of that blob is not the name of the real preprocess file. It's the name of a thunk that's going to produce the preprocess file. And by name, I mean the content hash. Is that clear what I'm trying to say? OK. So we ran this make file in like a few seconds. So as far as make's concerned, we've actually compiled it. Yes, sir? You, I understand what you're trying to say, but I think you've made a little bit of a leap from a thunk as a bunch of instructions in x86-64 language that are going to produce a totally deterministic output mm -hmm. to a thunk as the assembler or the compiler, which makes system calls and depend on the OS and you know execute non-deterministic instructions. So are you just assuming that those things are totally deterministic and, and sort of hoping? So, so we have we run in a sandbox that tries to forbid any system calls that are going to allow non-determinism. So get random, for example, we forbid, socket, we forbid. Um, so that's, that's our attempt to enforce determinism. I don't think determinism is totally required by this system, but uh, you want it if you want to be able to double check uh, an output. If someone tells you function x applied to data y gives you value z, and you're suspicious, it would be nice to be able to double check it and get the exact same answer. I mean, certainly with build systems, people worry about things like you know, timestamps on output executables. Oh yeah, so we care about that too. I mean, we, our, our continuous integration tests verify that we get sort of bit exact output. And the truth is that in the open source world, they have already done a huge amount of work to get bit exact builds that we're just sort of riding on the coattails of. So you can now build 90% of Debian you can build in a bit exact manner. So due to that, they had to go through tar and make sure it doesn't put timestamps in. And the compiler, you externally supply a random seed and all this stuff. This kind of level of abstraction is not going to apply to other problems domains. 
That's true. Well, they also have to become deterministic. So in the image compression I showed you, you know, at, at Dropbox, they're very important that it be deterministic because what they're terrified of is they'd write a file in September and they won't be able to decode it the next April. So uh, we, you know, the only mechanism we have there to guarantee determinism is we run it on a billion images and make sure that we always get the same answer. Uh, but you know, with three different compilers. But guaranteeing determinism is definitely an important prerequisite for this work, uh, at least if you want to be able to double check, and it's not one that I can solve for you. All right, so we end up with a file here that looks like, as far as makes concerned, it looks like FFmpeg, but it's not really a binary. It's just a little you know, reference that says, well, if you're really interested in the contents of this file, here's the thunk that you have to force. And we can actually describe this. Uh, and here's the actual thunk. I guess now we're writing this uh, this ugly format, but uh, you know, there's a function which has some hash, and here's the hash. And there's a bunch of arguments. And it depends on a bunch of prerequisites, some of which are thunks themselves. So we can actually look at the full, sorry. We can look at the full tree. Oh, wow. OK, well, we've optimized this program too much. Anyway. In the end, you can see there's 5,180 subproblems and 456 files totaling 50 megabytes. These are the prerequisite input data to compile this FFmpeg program. And if we actually want to do it, so right now, if I did it, it would not take any time at all because it's deterministic, and therefore we're going to find it in our cache. We're just going to find the outward the the, the thunk that says you know function x on data y. We're going to know what that is. So I'm going to blow away the cache here, otherwise it won't be very interesting. So let's try it now. So we're going to run this on AWS Lambda. We're going to have 2,000 way parallelism, and we're going to have a timeout of five seconds. If we don't hear from a particular thunk, we're going to run it again. All right, let's see if this works. All right, and oh, there we go. Okay, so you can see how much we've spent here in the lower right, and here's how many thunks have happened and how many are remaining. Let's see here. So there's no files to upload because we already had the source code in the cloud, and it knew that because it's all named by the hash. Let's see. Oh, man, this worked great when I was setting up. OK, here we go. We're in like the linking stage, the archiving. Let's see here. We got two running. All right, so we duplicated some jobs. We had some straggler failures. All right, come on. Hey, here we go. Downloading output files. OK, it worked. 34 seconds. It's twice as long as when I was setting up. All right. Yeah, so, you know. Anyway, so ultimately we compiled this thing. Uh, we used, you know, 2,000 machines in parallel. And we did it in the cloud. We spent like 20 seconds or something like that. So this, I sincerely believe, is sort of the future of, uh, well, I don't know why I'm here. Hang on. There we go. I sort of sincerely believe is the future of how we're going to interact with the cloud. I think renting a virtual machine and booting an operating system is like not the right abstraction. Um, so like people are going to want to run thousands of thunks in parallel for very short jobs. Like Almost anything you do, why not parallelize it to a thousand way? If you can, and if the overhead's not too bad. And you can think about trusting other people's assertions. You know, if someone signs a statement that says, hey, the file with hash such and such is this contents, I'm probably going to trust them. Because if they're lying, it's very easy to find out. You just rehash the file. Now, what if someone tells you, hey, the thunk with this hash, you know, function x applied to data y produces result z. You know, to trust them, you want to be a little more cautious. Because to double check that, you'd actually have to apply function x to data y and see the outputs. So you might, you know, there's different trust models you can imagine. You can imagine maybe I'll trust other people's cache assertions. And I'll run the program in a sandbox. But in the meantime, I'm going to recompile it myself in the background. And if I, look at it, if I get a disagreement, I'll know something bad has happened. And then what's important is that you can then prove to the world that someone is a liar, not just that you'll stop trusting them. You know, if someone signs a statement that says function x applied to data y is value z, if they sign a statement and I later have a disagreement, it's not just that I'll stop trusting them. I can send that to the New York Times and say, like, hey, don't trust Amazon anymore. Uh, no one should trust Amazon because here is a signed statement from Amazon that says function x to data y gives value z. Sincerely, Amazon. And you, the New York Times, can try it yourself, and you'll see that Amazon is lying. And this is proof that you know, Amazon should go out of business. So this sort of after the fact ability to shame could be a powerful way to allow people to trust other people's cash assertions uh, without sort of giving them free reign over your computer. Or you can imagine using secure enclaves here, where you could put, you could put your problems up on Reddit and people could, you know, could compete to solve them. Maybe you pay them. And they come back, they say, hey, I ran your job. Function x applied to data y produces uh, value z. Sincerely, Intel SGX. So I don't have to care who owned the computer that computed it. As long as I trust Intel and the isolation mechanisms of SGX, uh, you know, the secure enclave, that might be good enough too. So I, you, know, you could imagine that like, running 
code for other people. First of all, it's kind of in a totally safe way here because the functions don't do any undeclared I.O. They just read the blobs that they say they're going to read, and those blobs are named by their content hash. You can imagine that that's a safe thing you might run on your computer. And hopefully it would make you more money to run useful computation for other people than to search for hash collisions, which as we all know is, is what a huge amount of computational resources are, are currently going towards. So I, I think you know, this ability to have things be deterministic and to not care who is running the calculation I think is a sort of futuristic way uh, that we should be thinking about the interface between us and the people that own computers. And you could do this for a compilation and video encoding and map and reduce and database searches and all kinds of things. So ultimately, I think that refactoring the big parts of computing into small parts of computing and having granular functional interfaces, both to computing resources like Lambda and to algorithms uh, like video encoding or a compilation or congestion control is going to enable new kinds of applications. And we should think about refactoring these things when it makes sense. Just the ability to save and restore a program state and say, go back, try it again from where you were, it's a very powerful tool. It let us do sort of video encoding with uh, very, lots of parallelism, JPEG recompression that could fit in a distributed file system, real-time video encoding that matches the capacity of the network, and I, I hope we're going to be able to do sort of this general intermediate representation that lets anyone easily program for a target, this IR, that then you can run on all kinds of different uh, back-end platforms. Thank you for having me. Yes, sir. Were those um, 256-bit hashes that you were using? They were. Uh, which algorithm, how did you choose it? Uh, it was SHA-256, and you know the smart crypto people told me to use that one. Uh, yes, sir, in the back. So um, with this functional thing, you sort of made some assumptions, like for example, and you sort of implicit, like one, one of the things for where you didn't, not assumptions. So for example, with the frames, right? You Everything you've talked about is basically a frame stays as a frame. You never thought about maybe other ways of parallelizing, for mm -hmm. example, splitting a frame. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering maybe like why that is. It strikes me, for example, I want to do face detection, I can, and I want to do it in parallel, I can take a frame, chop it in some way, and Absolutely. just parallelize it. Absolutely. So I think when you're going to take something that's sort of monolithic and has sort of local variables that are sort of ungoverned, you know, an ungoverned amount of local state, and talk about dividing it up so that the state becomes explicit, I think that's where the sort of human intelligence comes into it, is finding a place to split the computation where the state between the two parts, you know, the, the communication that has to be exchanged makes sense for the problem domain. So in the case of uh, JPEG encoding, for example, or video, we're very interested that the state be concise. And so the inter-frame state is more concise to reason about and, and, and write down than the sort of intra-frame state. Uh, in cases where that sort of burden, you know, the, the weights are different, uh, then I think you have a different place you want to split. I mean, in JPEG, we split it you know, at every byte. In the video, if we had to split it at every byte, we wouldn't be able to do it. It wouldn't, it wouldn't work. We only split it at every frame. And so I think that the representation and the data structures matter a lot. If, if you decide that you want a parallel algorithm that's within frames, um, then you want to write down the picture in a way that you can split it efficiently. You know, if you're writing it as a JPEG, then splitting a region of the picture off is very expensive. You basically have to decode the whole JPEG. So I think, ultimately, it's employment for us uh, to figure out how to express these problems in a way that you can functionalize them. I d I'm not going to suggest I have some automatic way to do this. Yes, sir. I'm thinking about um, applying the GG structure to the X camera problem. Yes. Uh, the 13 megabyte um, figure you mentioned, was that the total, that was the inter-frame size, or was that also the size of the uncompressed state of the... Well, let's just multiply it out here. Thread? Uh, what I'm getting at is it seemed like you got benefit there from keeping all those threads alive and having each of them holding more local state than they were sending back and forth. So I was wondering if you tried to do that as thunks, wouldn't that result in much bigger thunks? Um, yeah, so one of those rasters, the, the 4K rasters, is about 12 megabytes. And so when we communicate, we only send one of them. We don't have the full three. So that's why I said it was 13 megabytes. Um, so the... I think what we're really trying to do here is abstract the language of the thunks from the execution strategy. And the thunk itself only has the hash you know, of the state. It's very small. And it's up to the execution engine to schedule the computation uh, where it wants to. So I think, honestly, we're going to use the same... It's going to be the same placement uh, with X camera, the monolithic system, as it is with GG. We're going to have to teach GG that you know, if there's a 13... Meg By the way, the hash... To be clear, our hash format is the, the SHA-256 hash plus the size. Those are both in the hash. So I think GG scheduler is going to learn that if there's a 13 megabyte object that's sitting on the hard drive of this Lambda, don't send it. Just schedule the compute to be where the data is already available. Um, I think um, 
that locality aware scheduling is going to be part of the scheduler algorithm. It won't be part of the programmer. And um, two other quick questions. Sure. One of them is um, actually, I guess, uh, really one. What do you plan to do next with this work? Are you planning to continue extending GG to other problem spaces, or do you, um, where do you expect this research to go next? Um, yeah, we're work So I think we want. I mean, we, we want to obviously demonstrate the power of the abstraction by implementing a few applications. Um, so in our paper that will be submitted at some point, we're going to have compilation, we're going to have um, video encoding, we're going to have a dynamic task graph with like face recognize and then face detect and then face recognize. We're going to have some sort of genomics thing. We have some generic model where you can take a sort of simple Unix task where the dependencies are named on the command line. That's a very easy one to model. Um, we have a Python SDK where you can write out thunks. Um, I think we had some other ones that are escaping me. So we want to demonstrate a small number of applications. But then, I mean, we've written it in a way that I think it's going to become, you know, in Debian and people will be able to use it. And I think the goal would be, I mean, if we're right, it will be an easy to use abstraction for any programmer to implement their application in that language. Um, you know, we also want more backends. We want it to be able to take an existing GG program and without changing the application, be able to run it on Lambda and OpenWhisk and Azure functions and Google Cloud functions, et cetera. Yes, in the way back. Um, I'm thinking of smaller problems on smaller uh, systems, devices, and things. Um, like one benefit of decomposing, you know, a problem like matrix multiply into little bits is is for cache coherency and, and cache awareness. Uh, mm -hmm. And and do you think this functional style and this decomposition of you know little tasks and the execution engine is also a good way to you know, to um, have a more general way of, of developing cache aware or cache uh, friendly algorithms? I, I do. Um, you know, there's a, a large literature from the late 70s about how to write, um, you know, how to execute Lambda expressions efficiently on hardware. And, uh, you know, do you use, uh, there's different kinds of reduction strategies and reference, you know, um, all this stuff. So there's a, I, I'm not a computer architect, but I do know that the architects have thought a lot about how to efficiently execute, you know, lambda type expressions in a, in a smart way. Um, my colleague, John Osterhout, is working on this granular computing initiative, and we talk about, you know, whether we could become the abstraction. You know, and he says, well, how long does it take to interpret a protobuf? And we say, oh, very fast, you know, maybe 50 microseconds. And he's like, <coughs> you know, I want the whole, the whole job is going to be five microseconds. So I think the question of what is the serialization format, um, you know, if, if you want five microsecond, you know, tasks, uh, it's going to have to become a more efficient representation. But I think the basic idea that the unit of computation is a named function applied to named data, uh, I don't think it's so far-fetched. Where those two things are just addresses. Yeah, yes, exactly. Uh, yes, sir. So, so, for example, let's say I want to use this style to, for, a new, for a new program, like for crypto, let's say. Sure. So, your approach requires me to really sit down and understand the whole crypto thing and to understand how to actually make my split. Whereas, if I take a step back, if, what do I want to do with crypto? I want to encrypt something. Well, okay, let's take the data and split it into chops and encrypt it and then build some sort of stru data structure on top of that. Mm -hmm. So it seems like... Well, so I think what you just said, you could definitely just express in the thunks. I don't think it would be that hard. Um, I, I think you'd only have to come to a deeper level of understanding if you wanted some more complicated structure. I see, I see. But uh, if you're telling me that the problem here is that it causes us to have to understand what we're really doing with our lives, I mean, I, you know, that sounds pretty good. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, you, the, the, the computational process you just described, you could write down very easily in, in thunks. Um, and, the, you know, the, you wouldn't be paralyzing the crypt operation itself. It would just be operating in a data parallel way. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Yes, sir. Um, so my understanding is that the forcing of an entire build is first you force the thunk that represents the final executable output. That then forces the thunk that invokes the linker, which forces the thunks that invoke the compilers and so forth. Absolutely. Um, but what's not clear to me is where does the suspended state of a partially resolved thunk live and how is it resumed? That is, when the linker is waiting for all those thousand compiles. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, so we don't, we don't do it that way. Uh, when we, if we're going to force the thunk for the linker, for example, 
we just look and we see, okay, what are the data dependencies that it needs? And if any of them we don't have, we don't actually start running the linker yet. We just say, okay, we got to force that one first. So it's a normal order um, execution. I see. So there's this scheduler that is looking at the linker and saying, oh, it's not ready yet. I have to force this. And then when that is ready, it has some algorithm for saying, here's all the things that were waiting for that, or all the things that are waiting, period. Something finished, what can I run now? Yeah, absolutely. So it's it's like a hash table in memory. It's not a sophisticated strategy. I see. So there's a single scheduler that has the state of kind of the current job, or yes. the current graph of thunks that's being transitively executed, and it's aware of pulling and driving that sort of transitive forcing process. That's true. And uh, that scheduler does synchronize these cache assertions to a global store when it feels like. So in addition to the fact that it has some pending execution, it also has this cache where, you know, because it's looking up in the cache, you know, because the, the linker will depend on some thunk, which ultimately, you know, runs the compiler. So the scheduler, the first thing it's going to do is say, well, do I already have a cached answer for what that thunk resolves to? And if I do, I don't have to run it. Then now I just have it. So, as, and at, so if you had multiple schedulers, they're both writing into this cache. So if one happens to write before the next one reads, then in that sense, they, they cooperate. Um, but there's no kind of thunk level representation of the partially resolved state of the graph. The entire kind of, the, the mapping from thunk to value is kept kind of in the scheduler and in this separate cache. It's not stored in S3 at a, at a, in a granular way. Well, it, it's, it could be. Um, we do re- I'm, I'm just it, it, Not at the moment. I think we might write it on disk, honestly. Um, because, you know, you, you, we have a thunk that's written in terms of all kinds of other thunks. And if, when any one of those thunks gets resolved to its data, we can rewrite the parent thunk and say, well, it doesn't depend on the thunk anymore. We'll just rewrite it to depend directly on the data. And that itself is a resolution step that we can record to disk. We may, I don't know if we do or don't right now, but we could record that to disk, even if right, it's not but then, fully. But, but that's an incomplete step because the upstream thunks have no idea about that until they get executed and you rewrite them as well. It's sort of like that, that rewrite is not um, visible to the dependents without oh, yeah, the scheduler's intervention. Well, no, because I, I don't quite agree with that. Because as soon as it goes in the cache, then any upstream thunk that wants to try and resolve itself is going to find that assertion in the cache. I see. Interesting. So you could have multiple schedulers that are all processing on this concurrently. And they can see each other's updates about all. Yeah. I see. Yeah, I think you could do that. Yes. You skipped past a couple of slides right at the end, and they looked interesting. Oh, sure. You want to, these are the graphs. So this is, here's compiling MOSH with a thousand way parallelism. You can see Andal's law is really harsh. So at the end, you know, we're running only one. So, okay, so what we see here is the blue is, is I.O. fetching the dependencies. The green is actually compute, and the red is uploading the answer back to S3. So here's an execution strategy where we just, every thunk is independent, downloads, runs, uploads. Um, you can see the fact that we, it's not such a big deal because the downloading all sort of happens in parallel. But what really kills us is just the amount of parallelism we're able to extract from the make file. You know, at the end when we're linking, there's only one job running, and uh, you know someone could invent a parallel linker, but that's not what we're doing. So you can see at the end we're, we're spending like half our time on the serial part of the task. This is Mosh. Here's a here's FFmpeg, and you you can see just the archiving, the linking, and the stripping is literally half the time. So, uh, is this make system available for people to play with? Yeah, 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 sure. I mean, it's still in development, but yeah, absolutely, you can. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, here's the URL. So. Well. It's right here. You can just clone that if you want. It's uh, yeah, Stanford SNR slash GG. It's, uh, there's like a, let's see if we can get there. All right, here it is. And uh, hey, we have a README. Okay, so yeah, um, yeah. I mean, we're trying to develop this as sort of like a usable piece of open source software, but it's definitely still sort of uh, in development. You need a license, though. What was that? You need a license. We need a license. Yes. All right. Thank you.